All right, well, we are a couple minutes after seven o'clock, so we are just going to get this thing going. Um, I would ask that if you are not actively talking, please keep your microphone muted so we cut out on some background noise and all of that. Um, so for any of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Erickson, and I am the alumni coordinator here at Weinbrenner Seminary. And I just want to start off by saying thank you all for being here tonight. This is a fantastic turnout, and I am super excited about it. Also, super excited to hear Juan talk in a bit, but we have a few things we got to cover first. So for any of you who are Weinbrenner alumni, and I know this is opened up to more than just that, but if you're an alumni of Weinbrenner, um, I hope you have signed up for our alumni e-newsletter. If you haven't yet, you can do so at weinbrenner.edu slash alumni, and you'll get information about upcoming meetings like this, other things for alumni, that sort of thing. We also have a Weinbrenner Seminary alumni Facebook page that you can go like. Um, and also, just so everyone knows, this is being recorded this evening. We have alumni who are not able to attend, so this recording will be made available on our Weinbrenner Alumni Facebook page for viewing later. And, you know, if you even just want to see it again, feel free, share it with your friends and family, all of that. It's good stuff. So another alumni related announcement is that pretty soon here we are going to be opening up nominations for the 2021 Distinguished Alumnus Award. You do not have to be a Weinbrenner alum to nominate someone, but the nominee does have to be a graduate of any program at Weinbrenner. So watch our Facebook page and your email if you're on our e-newsletter for further information on that. So what we're going to do tonight, um, just a bit here, I'll open us up in prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bruce Coates, Academic Dean of Weinbrenner, who's going to give a little update about what's going on with Weinbrenner and MCI, and then we'll turn it over to Juan for his talk. Um, the plan is that if all goes well, we'll have some time at the end of the evening for you to ask questions or reflect on Juan's talk and that kind of thing. So if you have questions while he's talking, hold them and we'll get to those at the end. So with that, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us as your people. We thank you for the partnerships that you have aligned between Weinbrenner Seminary and Marion Correctional Institution and the many lives that have not only been reached but have been completely transformed by your work through the people in these organizations. We thank you for this opportunity to gather online this way and we pray for your spirit to be on Juan as he speaks to us tonight. We give all praise and all glory to you, God, for all the work that you have done in Juan's life and for his willingness to share with us tonight. We pray for a time of encouragement and blessing for all of us gathered here tonight and for those who will watch later on the recording. And we ask all of this in the glorious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, so with that, Dr. Coates, Share your updates. Thank you, Katie. I have two updates and I will make them both very quick. It's good to be with all of you and to see you all. It's good to see my predecessor, Joel Cochran. Joel, hope things are going well for you. Um, we are honored to announce that uh, many of you may know we were the recipient of CARES Act money and that allowed us in this academic year to reduce tuition Students are currently paying $300 a month and they can take all the classes for which they are qualified to take. And that was throughout this whole academic year. We, um, the board of trustees met last week and voted to extend that and make that the persistent tuition amount. So beginning in the fall, students will pay $300 a month and they may take all of the courses for which they're qualified to take. We have done the math. And it is still cheaper to do that than it is to take one course a term at the old tuition. So we are, um, our, tu our enrollment has grown tremendously since we started that. And we are grateful for the CARES Act money, which has allowed us to, to experiment here and see whether or not this will work. And we believe that uh, it'll really help current students. Fortunately, it's not retroactive. Um, so if you graduated in 1977 or whatever, we're sorry, we can't reach back that far and make it retroactive. It is a, a moving forward kind of thing. And so uh, 
we're, we're, we're happy about that is for graduate programs and doctoral programs. I also want to give you a little bit, bit of update about what we are doing currently at, one, at uh, Marion Correctional Institute, as you know, because you're here to hear one. We had a cohort that went through and we started a second cohort at the beginning of the previous academic year, in the fall of 2019. And when COVID came the first week of March of 2020, we were told that all visitors, volunteers, and non-essential vendors would not be allowed back in until it seemed safe. We thought that would be a couple of months and we would be back in by the summer term. We are still not back on the ground. We worked diligently with a vendor to try to use a, a learning management system to educate remotely. That has not worked out, um, not on our end. We have significant time invested to try to make that work. It has not worked out on their end yet. So the chap current chaplain um, during that time period, Dr. Cola retired and Chaplain Smith is now the chaplain there. And um, he managed to come up with this idea. I, I think scheme is probably a good word for it. We have video recorded the lectures. Um, Dr. Mary Imes is teaching a class right now by video that we recorded them to DVD and sent them in. The uh, students at Marion watch those. Then they get a chance every other week to interact with her through some sort of a phone system. I have talked to them that way as well. It's not as clunky as it was described to me. It sounds like one of those World War II patch me through kind of things. Think radar and mash. Patch me through to I'm on my way to can you make seven stops. But it was, per, and it was fairly efficient. And so we are able to educate that way. It is not the best that, we, that um, could be done. It is the best that we can do today. And they are learning there. And of course, that has been challenging them and challenging their heart. And so we are very excited about that. If you have more questions, you're more than welcome to contact me. At, um, my email is bcoats at winebrenner.edu. And I'll put that in the chat box if you have questions about what we are currently doing. We are honored, honored tonight to have an alumnus of Winebrenner share with us. We are proud of all of our alumni but um, tonight we are anxious to hear from Juan and how he is ministering to people right now. Juan came through the MCI program, which means he came through Marion Correctional and has been out for several years and is ministering and doing so quite successfully. Juan, we're anxious to hear what you have to share with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dr. Coates. Uh, you know, I really want to give thanks to Weinbrenner. It's really uh, been a great opportunity for me uh, out here. Uh, the education has really uh, opened many doors for me the, 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 and some I had to turn down and um, I, I, I wouldn't have imagined that opportunities would have opened as quickly as they did. I, I left prison in uh, the summer of 2018 after serving 15 years for a drug offense and uh, to have been able to um, come this far this quickly is only attributed to the fact that you guys uh, decided to uh, take a chance and trust God to go on this wild journey and uh, things are opening up. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, uh, and recognize Katerina and Katie who have been so gracious and kind and, and patient every time they ask me to come on to, to help out They're They're very, they're very kind and, and helping me get my stuff prepared, uh, sometimes not on time, but uh, and, and still, um, I, I really appreciate them. And I'd like to get into the talk quickly. I know we're, we're short on time, uh, but I'd just like to share a little bit about uh, what the product of the education is, you know, what, what I've been doing, what the, God, what the Lord's been doing uh, with me and where he has me planted in ministry. As you know, I work with Kindway. I'm, I'm the director of development and communications for Kindway. Um, it's a restored citizen ministry. Uh, I know there will be a little bit of information in the notes or maybe the chat about how you can learn more about our ministry and, and maybe even a, a video link that you can watch our last fundraiser, not for the sake of raising funds, but just so you can, it's a very well put together informative video of what it is that we do with some testimonials and some impact videos. But um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do and, and this exciting new opportunity that we've called to and a wake up. Uh, Kindway is a prison ministry. It establishes mentoring and discipleship relationships with Christian men and women at two Ohio prisons, uh, one of them being Marion Correctional and the other being the Ohio Reformatory for Women. 
And our strategic plan for this year is to include entering a third site. Uh, we're hoping to be in Pickaway Correctional south of Columbus by the end of the year. Uh, conversations and, and negotiations are kind of underway now. And we think that that's pretty much well on track. Um, Kindways de was developed because many volunteers and staff members discovered along the way that there's a hole in prison ministry. Uh, there are many great ministries serving inmates, but there are almost none that continue their service after release. So many come to the prison and they serve us while there, but then there's no follow-up uh, to connect and remain connected with the people as they're released uh, for many different reasons. And well, Kindway exists to help people before, during, and beyond the transition. Uh, to date, Kindway has been there to help over 150 men and women transition, most of whom are capital offenders, in fact. Uh, and so the national average for people returning to prison within three years is over 50%. So in three years, 50% of the people leaving prison are returning uh, within three years. And in Ohio, that number is 30%. But for Kindway, of all of them who have, cre who have uh, essentially graduated or completed the two-year Kindway transition ministry, uh, that's a year inside and completed the year outside, only one has returned. We've had a few go back for uh, real violations and, and, and the like uh, on probation. And our recidivism rate, not over three years, but actually over nine years, which is a longer term, is uh, just under 5%. So God is at work in the lives of the alumni. Jesus Christ is at work in the lives of the volunteers and the staff. And we're grateful to be able to share that with you guys today. I'm glad that he's brought me on the team and made a place for me. Uh, the other ministry opportunity is uh, Two and a Wake Up. Uh, Two and a Wake Up is really a follow-up ministry to something Toriano Henry and I, who was my, my, my peer and, and, and brother in, at Marion, we graduated out of the first cohort at MCI through the PTI course. And when Toriano came home, we began a ministry at Central College Presbyterian in Westerville, and uh, we named that uh, Evergrowing Ministry, and that was to address the unique ministerial needs of those returning from prison. We really wanted them to have that transition uh, space where they felt safe and comfortable in a familiar space. And well, as you guys know, uh, Toriano has been upgraded. He was uh, welcomed at Wharton uh, COG and uh, he's now an associate pastor there for discipleship, I believe, if, if I'm correct. And uh, so we had to restructure uh, what we're doing. Um, and uh, we've named it Two in a Wake Up. And as I said, we have our home at Central College still and that happens to be, have another Weinbrenner connection because Dr. Jim Zappay, who's also an alumni from Weinbrenner, is the outreach director and contemporary service pastor at Central College. Uh, Dr. Zappay happened to be my Kindway navigator when I came home, and he was also a professor for two of our um, courses while at Marion. Uh, when I came home, Dr. Zappay allowed me to be a volunteer on his audio video team and after a few months, he uh, asked me if I wanted to come on full time at, or at, at least, well, uh, come on as a contractor, uh, audio video tech for his contemporary service. And we've been doing that for a while. So that's been another area of ministry I enjoy doing and it, and it helps uh, with supplemental income. So I thank God for Pastor Jim for taking me under his wing and mentoring me. Now, Two and a Wake Up is reference to the time Jesus spent in the tomb, but uh, it, it's kind of mingled with a little bit of prison lingo or jargon, right? Um, the wake up, uh, when we're in prison, counting the days to our release, uh, we don't count the day we go home because that's our wake up. That's the day that we wake up and go home in the morning. So if I had a week, uh, if, if it's Sunday and I'm leaving the following Sunday, I would say I have six and a wake up. Well, Jesus was raised on the third day. So essentially in the tomb, Jesus was there for two and a wake up. And uh, our tagline is celebrating resurrected lives, uh, lives, right? We celebrate resurrected lives, which is really fitting because it ties the resurrection of Christ, not only on that day, but as Romans 8, 11 says, even in these mortal bodies. So uh, the idea of connecting uh, the resurrected life, the, the time in the tomb with, with this idea of prison, people coming home on fire for Christ uh, is interesting because they're really living resurrected lives, even in these mortal bodies. So so yeah, you know that that's what's going on. That's what's that's what's happening with me, and I'm I'm glad to report all that. And uh, 
I'm amazed at God's faithfulness. Uh, he's carried me through some very dark times and uh, considering from where he's brought me, it's almost, it's almost unbelievable. Uh, just in the time Dr. Cole has known me, uh, I'm sure even he thinks it's unbelievable how far because I, I was a knucklehead even halfway through my sentence. And, and uh, beyond delivering me, I guess, from uh, just the life and consequences of my crimes, uh, that he would use me to advance his mission is, is really quite amazing. Uh, and, you know, allowing me to bring light into the darkness is, is truly fascinating. I, I'm reminded of a story I share often. Maybe you've heard it, but if you haven't, it may be new to you. It's, it's about the time near the end of my sentence. I am part of a team that the warden allowed us to put together. And it was a team called the Prayer Warriors. And we we're allowed to go on Wednesday nights into the whole uh, segregation. It's a, it's a whole different unit that's very... Um, uh, high security where the people who break the rules in prison go to do their time. So if you're in the prison and you got to go to jail, you go to the hole. And we call that O block. And uh, it was a team of volunteers from Kairos and Torch and also uh, a few inmates who were trusted to go in. And um, I really had never really appreciated, maybe not in that time, but you really don't appreciate the service God has done for us until you've engaged in service yourself. And you really don't appreciate the sacrifice until you sacrifice, until you get into the crisis of other people that you really appreciate how Christ himself came into our crisis. And it, um, that was really a cherry on the top of the entire experience of serving in Marion before I went home. And uh, the first visit to the whole allowed me to experience what so many volunteers experience coming in. Uh, they, they come into our prison and they share the love of Christ. And I essentially was going into our prison and got to experience what that was. And it really reflects the Christ and the incarnation who entered our prison, right? And, and it really moved me. And I remember the second day, the second week, I'm walking into this place and we're, we're in the little Sallyport area and we're waiting for them to unlock the gate so that we can go down the, the, the aisles. There are four aisles, there's two tiers and two, uh, 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 rows of cells on the bottom as well. And there are about 30 cells in each. So there's four rows of 30 cells. And I had adopted the lower south, I think it is. It's the lower row on the, on the bottom. And I would start at the furthest cell and work my way back to the middle. And they pop the gates and I'm walking through and I'm really thinking, wow, you know, I, I've really come a long way. I knew who I was. I knew how far he had brought me. And I'm, I'm really feeling good about myself. Not, not in an arrogant way, just in a very... It was a very humbling moment. And for a brief moment, I dared to think that I was taking Jesus into that place. I was taking his light into that place. As I'm walking, I'm about halfway down and I get this, this gut check, right? Like the Holy Spirit just grips me and says, you're not bringing me in here. I'm already in here. You're just following my call. You're catching up to me. I, you know, Jesus Christ is in that place and we get to participate in what he's called us to, to that which he's called us. And, and, and I almost, I almost, I almost break down and I'm, I, I feel it now. And as I approach that final cell, knowing there's somebody there waiting, um, it, that this, this, this image in my mind, I don't see it physically, but I have this image in my mind that Christ is standing outside that door and that he's waiting for me to introduce him to the people behind that door. And that's the privilege we have to serve, serve Christ and, um, that these lessons have really um, equipped me for for what it is to what he calls us, you know, this this life of service. And so we're put um, in a position at that time to bring light into a dark place. And the evidence wasn't just in what I'm saying. It's, it was evident in the testimony of the guards who work there and, and the segregation, because the hole is usually the loudest and, and the darkest place in the prison. There's not much else you can do to the people who are in there who are rowdy. They're already in trouble. There's nowhere else to send them. So they're spending their time banging doors and yelling and, and playing rap beats on their metal bunks. And maybe they're yelling from cell to five cells to communicate with their buddy who's in there. And it's this cacophony of just noise and you can't escape it. And when our team would arrive though, the, the officers would often tell us that we'd get there at 8 p.m. on Wednesday night and it became quiet. It became 
it became hollowed ground. It, 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 this peace and this respect fell upon the entire unit. And um, that's what happens when the light enters the darkness. And um, so I thought to speak on that a little bit. I thought to speak on that because it seems like there's this growing concern among those in ministry of how dark and anti-Christian the world seems to be becoming. And well, maybe this is the case, I don't know. Relatively speaking, I mean, at any given time, the church has been constantly persecuted somewhere around the world, but maybe for we in the West, this is a new thing. Maybe we feel a little off balance at times because uh, when longstanding institutions, including the church are being threatened by social and cultural pressures uh, to fundamentally change or, or even cease to exist, it can kind of throw us for a loop. And some would even argue that there's a war being waged on constitutional freedoms of religion and maybe even on private wealth and small businesses and churches everywhere are closing and those that are reopening are finding that that many are not returning for many different reasons and we seem to be getting more and more disconnected without any uh, semblance of a way back to what normal was. And for me, this is concerning, right? Because I'm, I'm a development guy, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that there's uh, wealth and, 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 and prosperity and that God blesses his people so that we can continue doing our work. And our, our ministry is almost entirely dependent on private and church support. And if local businesses and private wealth are in jeopardy and if church attendance will remain down at record levels, our ministry, fiscally speaking, uh, possibly could be in jeopardy. And, you know, maybe some of you have been discussing some of these things in your board and committee meetings. And indeed, for many, it seems very dark. But I'm really not here to harp on what's obvious. I'm, I'm really here hoping to offer some hope. You see, we're the church. We were built for this time. If, if indeed we have been building on the so solid foundation, if we've been building on the solid foundation of what's been handed down to us from Jesus himself, and that being that we're the body of believers, that we're the body of believers indwelled with the spirit and armed with the confidence that nothing catches God off guard. We advance his mission knowing that his plan of redeeming the world was never a plan B after the fall. But if, I, I've heard a preacher say before, the DNA of redemption is built into creation. In Revelation and elsewhere, we read that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And if this is so, then we can take courage that God has since before time, he knew he would save us before he made us. Uh, what love, what love is that? No, that he would create us knowing that Jesus would die for us. And when it's dark, our path is illuminated with this fundamental reality that God is good and God is with us. So now is not the time for the church to go into hiding. Now is the time to proclaim more loudly than ever that Christ is Lord and his kingdom will have no end. Just as the fall of mankind did not catch God off guard, neither has this current darkness. And because he has not returned, his mission remains. That we continue making disciples, that we continue making active agents, advancing God's redemption plan. Jesus, knowing what awaited him pressed forward in obedience. He, he did not quit when, when he was overwhelmed with opposition. He did not become complacent and just write it out the few years of his life in routine, knowing how it would end. He, he did not assume the role of a victim worrying about the injustices he would endure. But yet it is so easy for us sometimes to slip into these traps of the enemy. I'm convinced that darkness thrives not because of Satanists, not because the enemy needs us to join forces with him, but simply when the church is taken out of the fight. The prince of darkness doesn't need us to take a stance against the kingdom of God. He just needs us to quit following Jesus, quit allowing the light of Christ to shine through us. I recall, I recall laying in my bunk and I was uh, meditating, and this was early in my sentence, I was meditating on a devotional I was going to write for P2P, Prisoner, Prisoner, and it was called, uh, it had to do with um, 
our lives were meant for more than sin management. This life in Christ was more than sin management. We weren't created to sit off in the corner and I and other prisoners were just not satisfied with simply being put in a corner and be told to be still uh, so that we wouldn't cause any more damage, right? We'd cause enough damage. Just be a Christian and be nice and go sit off in the corner. We don't, we don't want you to destroy anything else. And the problem is when the spirit of God takes over, we can't sit still. We can't sit still watching our surroundings fall apart. And I was gifted with this imagery of a diamond. And it wasn't a rough diamond, but a, a precisely cut stone, the kind of stone that would shimmer when the, when, when the most subtle light would, 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 would pass through it. And God revealed that we are to be as this diamond, cut and fashioned and formed by the master in order that we would shine as the light of Christ passed through us. And then I imagine the contrast of sitting in a stool, on a stool in a dark, in a dark closet in which I, I, was, I was in this closet and I was holding a diamond and a common pebble in the other hand. And in this darkness, I opened both my hands and, and I rolled each stone in my fingers and they felt the same and they looked the same. And in the darkness, I could not tell the difference. I could not make the distinction between this finely polished stone formed by the king and a common pebble. And I think this exposed maybe a little bit of fear in me about what serving God in a dark place would be and the dangers of, of secluding myself uh, during dark times and, and, and troubled times and, and opposition. But it also gave me the encouragement that God was going to be there for us. It, it gave me, uh, it influenced my growth and the confidence in his provision for those advancing his mission. Prison was not an easy place to learn to follow Christ. Not only do we need the, over, uh, the, 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 the grace to overcome depression because it's, it's hard to continue just being when you're away from your loved ones and you, and you miss your freedoms and you just feel oppressed all the time. And then to, to be a servant leader in that place, it, it's not easy. We needed to keep being encouraged to, to take a stand for Christ. And the other downfall is that often it would make you popular for all the wrong reasons among, among our peers. Many would assume we were fakes. They would project that we were hypocrites. They, and worse still, they suspected that we were snitches. But God sent us examples, amazing volunteers and even staff members to be lights for us in our paths toward maturity in a very dark place. Over time, God turned one of the most violent prisons in Ohio to the safest adult male prison in Ohio, except for Hawking Hills, which at the time was the place where people went to expire. It was essentially the hospice of prisons and nobody's fighting there. Marion for a long time was referred as Camp Hug-a-Thug. <laughs> that's, that's what they call it, Camp Hug-a-Thug. There was so much love passing through those halls. I arrived at a time when it seemed God was openly welcome everywhere in the institution. His light was shining all over that place. And maybe it could be argued that we got complacent and some of us fell into routine and just took all what God was doing there for granted. And maybe we let off a little bit on outreach. At some point, I worked in an area that was run by secular humanists. In meetings, they would talk about how they wanted to prove that they could achieve the success that we saw from the Christian programs, but without God. I witnessed this ideology take over the prison and it, it, it's really what eventually led to a huge scandal that caused the prison to go into a very dark and restricted time. But even then, the ministries that were focused on discipleship like Torch and Kindway Embark and others, they still thrive. They were still welcome. God provides in the darkness. Many times along the way, we needed to keep our brothers encouraged to remain active in ministry so that God's kingdom would not lose steam. And when things would get dark or policies would change that made it difficult to gather or when ministries would be infected with heresy or blatantly selfish people in order that they would benefit from the perks. We learned it was very difficult to want to continue fighting uphill battles and hold positions for Christ alongside these guys. Some brothers didn't feel we were seeing any results from our efforts and at times and and when the privileges were gone, many felt it was unjust and we just assumed a victim role. It was through these experiences though that the Lord taught me two very important lessons about serving in darkness and 
And these lessons have been extremely helpful in ministry for me on the outside, out here through this pandemic, through cultural opposition. Number one, success is not in the results. Success is in obedience. And number two, suffering is, in fact, God's mercy. I was in a conversation at the end of a weekend ministry, and as we prepared for the final function, this volunteer was there with me, and he asked me, how many of the 42 men served that weekend would be new converts to the faith? And I said, you know, prob probably four. We'll probably get about four, and that's 10%. And he dropped his head, and he was uh, sadly, you know, as though it wasn't enough of a result for the effort. But those were new converts. Others were already saved. Others were already believers. But new converts, I thought, wow, four is great. In that moment, the Lord impressed upon me that our success wasn't in the results, but in the obedience, and the obedience that glorifies him. In our service, we reflect our God, which is what he intended from the beginning, right? I mean, he made Adam in his image, and in Christ, he remakes us in his image. And I don't know that there's anything more uh, important in all creation than God's children reflecting his image or even refracting his light. I think of Jesus' work, and I have to ask, was he a failure? Would, he, would we argue Christ is a failure if nobody received his salvation? Of course not. You see, because Christ, his success was not in our response, but in his redeeming work. His success is in his obedience to see it through. And I think this word made a difference because this person is still a prison mission volunteer many years later with Kindway. And I think what helps us to press forward being a light in the darkness is to reframe our theology to fit with reality so that we wouldn't succumb to the disappointments of not achieving unrealistic expectations. But when disappointment comes in ministry, uh, I learned that suffering is God's mercy. This idea was really a paradigm shift for me when I learned that, um, I, I really learned it the hard way. You know, it's, it's easy when we're in ministry to get caught up with this idea that, that we're more deserving than to experience injustice, that we're more deserving than to experience opposition and suffering. And we forget that even as Christian, we're fallen creatures dependent on God's mercy and grace. Many times I've allowed myself to assume the victim role when, when I would experience suffering. And it's, it's really nothing new because a God who would allow suffering is really the excuse I use most to reject God. And this trap is really nothing more than pride that, that, that thing that creates this elevated sense of myself. And we're in dangerous territory when we allow the devil to convince us, just as he did in the garden, that God is holding out. When we forget that suffering is God's mercy because he chooses to allow us to continue living in our sin and our fallen state when we deserve so much worse. And the arrogance of this victim worldview has set me up in the past for disappointment because of my overestimated opinions of myself and, and what I thought I deserved. And to be honest, this, this, this belief would often lead me to hold my service hostage until I got what I wanted, right? I would, I would hold my service and my, my, my obedience hostage until God pulled through for me. But I wasn't going to win that. He's got this whole eternity thing on his side and waiting out wasn't going to work. So when I learned the proper understanding of suffering, it developed a gratitude and uh, that, that better equipped me to endure through it so that I may never grow weary in doing good. So what am I getting at? Well, I guess we've been thrown a curveball with 2020. Ministries everywhere are still trying to figure out how to shift and how to remain relevant and many are looking for a way back to normalcy and this darkness. And I don't see any signs of that ever getting back to what they were, but what I'm certain, uh, uh, that which I'm certain is that God is good and he's faithful and God is with us to grant us the grace to be beacons of his light in this darkness. At Kindway, COVID has kept us from the prison for uh, almost a year. And like many, we had to pivot, but our pivot was probably a little bit differently than, than other people. Our mission to invest in those who are impacted by incarceration uh, already had mentorship, discipleship relationships built into it. So we're doing the mission of God and God supports his mission. But what also is happening is that God's plan for discipleship and, and, and developing indigenous Christian leaders that are able to function in their context independently of our missionaries, of our navigators, was built into this as well. So we had leaders being developed inside who could carry forward the mission of God, even though we couldn't go in. 
And while we were unable to visit the men and women, we had partners inside prison, employees who would step up and help us finish our Embark programming. And as that was going on, our pivot was a shift toward identifying restored citizens in Columbus to offer them the same ministry opportunities of those inside. Inside, we named the ministry Embark. Outside, we named the ministry Embrace. And now people who have not recovered from their past incarceration could benefit from the same programming, mentoring, and discipleship relationships as those inside. And our pivot wasn't simply shifting our focus to a new way of doing things, but expanding our vision to see the larger mission field in Columbus. Another thing that works so well for us is that we know that our volunteers and missionaries, we call them navigators, they're also on this journey of discipleship and they are also maturing in their face to serve. So in essence, it's a discipleship opportunity for them as well. We've developed training for our volunteers that would help them as they mentor our alumni. And through the Embrace program, many are taking and being transformed by the exact same programming that we offer to our men and women inside. We're not sure how this chaos of 2020 is gonna shake out. We don't even know how it's gonna affect Kindway in the long term. Our, fund, our, our, our main fundraiser, uh, there may be a link on this in the notes, but it had to go virtual. And as a development guy, I'm like, oh, how is this gonna turn out, you know? And I had to manage that project. And all I knew to do was to continue trusting the Lord as we had learned to do while we were in the, inside the prison. I was confident that we were passionate and on point with discipleship for everybody in our network. And I trusted God as always was gonna provide for his mission. And he's doing just that during the pandemic. We, our support has increased to record levels. That's gonna help us expand into a third prison. We're told that we were the first to be asked to return to Marion and finally set foot back in the institution last week. And while so many ministries are unable to get inside prison, we've not only regrained our footing, but we're expanding. Additionally, the Ohio Parole Board has asked Kindway to pilot a new program uh, that they're gonna roll out statewide. And this is really all to the glory of God. It may be dark, but the Lord is illuminating our paths so that we may find our way in any darkness. I have learned these lessons while in prison and they're serving me well out here. And although we're in a time of political, social, and cultural upheaval, and we face the uncertainty of a health crisis, this is really not the time for us to run scared, but to rejoice because the Lord desires to be glorified in his children. The Lord has left us a mission to perform until his return. And he will see us through if we trust and obey. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in the light who entered the darkness, who illuminates our hearts that we may be beacons of his hope and love in this current darkness. I, I don't assume Kindway success is a pattern that would be the answer to every other ministry's approach to mission, but I know getting back to the basics has proven to be the pattern that has worked everywhere at all times. This discipleship missional approach for which the Lord fully uh, makes provision. It, it is this that he multiplies. We don't know what's coming in the months or, or what the coming years will bring, but if we don't lose heart or become bitter and suffering, and if we remember that success is in obedience rather than results, we would be better positioned to be light during these dark times. I'm encouraged with these words, First Peter chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as for foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. There's such good lives among you that the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, to the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and who commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. 
but it is to your credit if you receive a beating for doing, but how is it credit to you if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. This, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. I like... Um, I like Matthew 5. I'll end with this. Let's remember in these dark times, right, that we are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do uh, people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In a similar way, now is not the time for the church to hide in a closet where no one can distinguish us from a common stone. We're diamonds, baby, created to shine brilliantly in the darkness as the light of Christ passes through us to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that, Juan. Great message. Thanks for having me. Does anybody have any questions, comments, anything for Juan? Juan Martinez, ah. I praise God for the miracle he has done. My heart is filled with gratitude. Lord took somebody so stubborn man and turned him into this gentleman. Only God can do a thing like that. Maybe Self I can be stubborn and gentle, doc. Oh, yes. <laughs> Self-proclaimed theologian. To real theologian, only God can do that. I praise God. I, today, I really thank all that you are doing. You are a changed man. You are totally dedicated and humble. You have several skills, technical skills. You are a bilingual. You have a cultural sensitivity. I praise God the way you're helping Kind Way Embark and uh, brothers coming from the prison. I praise God from Weinbender Theological Seminary, all the professors that came and visited us and taught, all the volunteers with their prayers, with their donations and with their time, and the Board of Trustees, everybody, past and present administration has done a remarkable job. I, I'm, I'm really so glad to see you. It's like, a, I can't tell, it's like a coronation. You're sitting there, talking as a church leader, as a pastor. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I still remember the very first time I brought you into the chapel office, thinking about a possibility of going to the seminary. I remember all those talks and now I hear you. Only God can do this miracle. So I praise God. My only question is right now, you said several times, these are dark days ethically, morally, there's so much trouble in our nation, in the prisons. We have 18 of our little brothers studying. They're so depressed and they're so confused. What advice do you give to them to stand up and be strong for Christ? Please give that advice. I, I think Doc, um, it, it really requires us to reframe our thoughts to something that's more fitting with reality. For me, uh, we, we, we had tough times in there, not quite as badly as they, but um, most of our disappointments coming from bad ideas, from inadequate ideas. Um, we don't have out here uh, the privilege to tell God we're not gonna do the work because things are difficult. And they're gonna have to hear that as well. The best form of the, the, the best form I've heard before said the best form of love is the truth. They're, they're called on a mission and that mission goes forward regardless of how we feel. I'm sure God is compassionate and loves us, but we have to really, uh, that, that's where the rubber meets the road. We have to decide if we're really on board for this and we're gonna, we're gonna put aside the discomforts for the sake of the kingdom, no matter what those are. Those that led us, uh, uh, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants we hear, right? 
the apostles suffered uh, injustices far greater. I mean, we're, we're in prison for what we've done. And that's the reality. The apostles suffered injustices we could never imagine. And they were committed by God's grace to carry the mission through. And we just have to speak frankly and directly about that and let the Holy Spirit work. And, and, and you know what? We could do a better job on the inside as inmates to really learn to build a community around each other and, and, and be our encouragement for each other. Um, th there's no reason why, um, if they wanna be in ministry, well, it starts now minister to each other don't wait for people to come from the outside that was a, one of the traps we almost fell into many times in seminary waiting for the people from the outside to come rescue us when they were trying to develop indigenous ministers in prison to take care of each other thank you anyone else comments questions things you'd like to hear Juan talk about <laughs> I don't sing. <laughs> well. All right. Well, uh, just Katie, before we go, uh, Juan, I, I just want to say thank you for tonight. Um, you're a, you're an amazing child of God that he can really use, I, I remember, I believe it was the second course, Linda Draper, Dr. Draper taught the first course in the cohort and it was the second course, our instructor, our professor from the seminary, I believe it was um, a theology course, came back to me after two or three weeks and said, I asked him how things were going, just kind of as a review and kind of get his observation. And uh, he said, it's going very well. And they're sponges. They're just grasping everything they, they can grasp. And they, they just want more and more and more. And he said, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm able to meet, you know, uh, all of the, giving them all the moistures that their, spo their sponge can contain. And he said, and there's, and there's, there's this, this one student that just really sticks out. And I said, well, well, who's that? And he said, Juan Martinez. I said, well, what, what makes him stick out? And he said, um, well, if it doesn't violate any kind of privacy, you ought to read his paper that he's written. And uh, I thought, I'm the academic dean, he's the instructor. I, I don't think there's any you know, privacy act that would cover that. I said, well, sure, I'd love to read it. And I, I knew I knew in reading your theology, my goodness, I said to this instructor, I said, where can we buy 20 of these guys and I put them in the seminary right away? I said, you know, I had students you know, that couldn't even begin to hold a candle to, to your thought processes and your, your maturity in the faith and, and your, your ability to express yourself. And, and I knew right from then that you had talents abounding and, 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 and just watching you progress then through, through the, the, the years, that was year number one. And then you know, as an instructor myself, the fourth year uh, in leadership, seeing how you had matured. I just want to say to you, Juan, God bless you and keep the faith, keep strong, keep pressing on. Um, you, you are, you know, you are an asset to the kingdom and God, you are correct. God honors faithfulness and stay faithful and true and I just want to encourage you with all that I have behind me and can say, and the words don't seem to express it well enough. Um, be strong, be of good faith, be of encouragement, continue to fight the faith and you've got the tools and God has blessed you and you will be a blessing to many others. 
So God bless you and keep you and just keep keep going on, Juan. It's just so great to see you and to see where uh, where God has used you and how he has shaped you and molded you. And um, keep fighting. Keep fighting the faith. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. I hope I, I um, leading into this, I was hoping that um, you would be grateful to the Lord for the investment that you've made and that it's returning on it. Um, I'm really grateful for the family he's given me and all of you and the family he's putting in, in my life now as, as, as networks are growing. Um, pray for me, please. My, my only prayer seems to be now, don't let me blow it today, Lord. And I come close. <laughs> I come close every, every week. When I can remember the first time I was there and you were with a group of four or five other guys and I was standing over, had just left another conversation. This young man came walking over to me and he said, are you going to offer a hermeneutics class? Uh, it, I had to stand and think and stop for a while because you don't usually get asked that at seminary. And I thought, here's a prisoner and you said, I think it is the most important class and we don't get it other places and you need to help us to understand how to interpret the word of God. Mm -hmm. And I knew then, <laughs> I knew then that God was at work. Um, and I say, thank you also. And Juan, I remember one time <laughs> I was talking to the class about this, that, and something else, and how it all fit together, and and I had it all figured out. And you said, "I think it's more than that." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for it, but nonetheless, you, and you had thought at a level that many people had not thought, and and you also were extremely gracious in class. And I saw you coming alongside those who are a little more reticent than you. And uh, you help to bring them out. And thank you, Juan. You're a great Christian. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Doc. And then, Juan, uh, go ahead. Juan, I was, yeah, I was going to just say, Juan, my prayer for you is, is that um, you continue to stay strong and not be tempted you know, by big churches saying, Juan, come minister with us, because, you know, you're going to think, hey, I'm going to be working five days, six days a week, and I get, you know, Sundays off. Well, not really, but you're going to think many of those days that you're going to be working at a big church involve like playing golf, and I know how much you love golf, and you're thinking, <laughs> hey, if I can teach Stan Stever how to hit a drive straight, how, who knows how many other guys that can teach how to hit a golf ball right so i'm just saying don't be tempted by the big <laughs> churches and what they're going to offer you're there for a purpose and continue to do that and and again be that diamond because there are not enough uh not enough diamonds in our world and and we need more we, meet, we need more diamonds in places where you're at thanks dave praise the lord man amen i, I just want to make one quick comment in saying that I had an opportunity to, to go down with um, the first cohort. So I got to know Juan over the course of four years. Um, and I was so challenged, so encouraged, felt so loved by my brothers in Christ. And I am very, very thankful to God for you. And love comes out in actions. And you see that through Juan and the other guys in the cohort. They just don't say it, they actually live it out. And I had a moment, and it took me eight years to graduate from the seminary, um, but on my graduation day, I was having a moment with the Lord um, right before the ceremony. And I knew I was gonna lose it and cry. And so I like stopped myself and I stood up and I turned around and through the door walked Juan Martinez. And I lost it <laughs> because he traveled all the way to Finley, which he had a lot of hoops to go through to be able to do that, um, to celebrate with me. And 
I'm just so grateful for the time that I got to be with you and watch you grow. And you know, you watched me grow um, and we just encouraged one another. And I'm just so thankful to our father that we're a brother and sister in Christ. So. Amen. I'm, up, I'm down for that. Thanks, well, I have a question. Um, with your, your current ministry, and then um, as they as um, the seminary progresses towards the, the new cohort, from your perspective, these folks that are centering on the call today or the folks that are going to see the recording, what would be the two or three things you'd say that would be most impactful that they could do um, to help you expand what you're doing now um, with your current program or to help the seminary expand what they're doing in the uh, um, with the guys that are on the inside going through the, the PTI classes? What would be most influential for, for the guys inside or? Uh, what, what things if you, if you had, if, if somebody wanted to get involved in, or they wanted to, I was going to talk to other people, what, what do you see that that is in most need what would you all like to add i i love the you talked about the recidivism rates going from um, 30 40 percent down to to nine percent it, it seems to me that there's still things you all would like to do that you could do that would uh continue to move what you're doing forward I think right now it's access. We're just waiting for access. We have, uh, we, we leverage about a hundred volunteers. I don't know if that's dwindled since COVID, but uh, they're, they're ready to go. You know, uh, we just need access. Uh, we we, we, we want to impact more people, but you can only go so deeply. We're so, um, we're so selective in who we take in. We want to make sure that our, our housing and employment partners are getting cream of the crop. So we're, we're looking for, champions for christ and um sometimes it's all we can do to get one class so the only way we can expand is by going into another institution because people develop over the years and then uh you know it, it, instead of going deeper in one institution we're really thinking that it's probably in our best interest to go to a third institution and take 10 or 15 from there every year uh right now our, our biggest hindrance is access and it looks like things are opening up now for us and we're excited uh volunteers at the moment um we, we were always searching for them uh, and, and trying to find new ones. And um, it, it's, it's really hard to take on anymore because we don't want them sitting and, and let the, you know, the fire wane when, when there's nowhere to put, put them in placement. Um, that, that's really a, a tough question for me because um, we know they're ready. We just need to have access to the mission field. So we, you know, we're, we're developing new ideas out here of how to uh, help people more generally uh, and uh, we, we think that's going to work out, maybe uh, restructuring that a little bit. Uh, prayer and support, you know, we, 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 we have uh, five or six, I think it's six full-time equivalents on staff, and uh, financial support is always a help because um, we don't want to do all the work. We just want to provide the access for those that want to do the work. That's always helpful, and prayer, prayer for, for direction and guidance, and uh, we, we can't do what we do without being very clear to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Um, things, things, we're, we're in uncharted territory right now. We don't know how things are going to pan out here with, with the way things are working in our, um, you know, socially and, and, and politically. And we, um, we, we just need discernment and clear direction for the guys inside um, to, to help push that forward. I, I think one of the best things we have in our arsenal is impact videos and impact statements and really showing people in action who are, uh, if we need to raise support for those on the inside, show what's possible, show what the investment produces. Um, and for the guys inside, what I would say to them, what they, the, the, the biggest thing I needed to hear, if, if I could have somebody tell me is don't sweat when there's things don't go your way. You know, when there's adversity, when we can't, when our, when our people can't get in for class and they're held up because of a gate pass or whatever, it, it, that might be that opposition is God probably exposing us in a way that we need to conform to Christ. That, that was an opportunity in which I failed many, many times getting emotionally uh, uh, overcharged about 
uh, unfairness and how sometimes people were treated coming in. Um, and uh, I, I know that, that you all were welcome there from the administration, but sometimes it was very difficult to get in and we uh, assumed to be uh, emotionally charged about those things. And I wish I was more disciplined and, and had learned to ask for God's grace to say, let me be the example in this moment to trust God in this moment, to be an example to my peers that there's something different about what God's doing in our life than the everyday man. I, I would say for the people inside, they need to know that um, you may not think of yourself as being put on a pedestal, but your neighbors are gonna put you there and they're gonna wanna see you fail. And there are many times through the process that I failed for not being more disciplined in, my, in the way I responded to adversity. Um, God's not surprised when we're going through this darkness. God's not surprised when you guys weren't able to get in on some days. So why was I acting like it caught off, got, got off guard and I had to be the defender of what was right and wrong? Um, it, 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 it's tough to be an, an inmate um, leader in that place because um, the bullseyes on your back and um, we have to properly represent Christ. Uh, for the guys inside, I'd, I'd encourage them with with uh, standing firm and trusting God that regardless of what adversity comes, he's in control and they're gonna see their way through. He's gonna see their way through it. He's in this thing. You know, hopefully it's evident in the ministries that God's building around us, not only in here, but uh, out here, but in there. For those, uh, you know, that don't understand prison ministry and the, the importance of um, maybe to get behind the support of the, of the seminary program is that we don't treat the prison mission field like we treat any other mission field. We develop local missionary, uh, local pastors in Ghana. We develop local pastors in Haiti. We develop local pastors in the inner city so that they can uh, lead in their context. But we don't do that in prison. And you guys are probably the only people I know that are doing it. And uh, it, I would encourage you guys to consider messaging that to the people for support. We are developing missionaries in the prison mission field who live there. You know, I, I don't know what the outcome you guys think should be, but really the outcome God desires is more active agents working on behalf of his mission. I don't know if that answered your question, but I'm an INTP, so I tend to ramble. Thank you, Dan. All right, well, we are a few minutes after eight o'clock. Um, so Juan, if you wouldn't mind closing us in prayer and then we will leave the meeting open for a little bit if anybody wants to stay and visit, but you know, we'll kind of wrap things up for those who need to get going. Of course. Yeah, let, let, let's assume an attitude of prayer. As always, Lord, I must acknowledge that you're awesome. Never because we say so or we think it's the right thing to say, but because you've revealed yourself to be amazing. You've revealed yourself to be good. You could have wiped us clean from existence and yet you suffered long with us. You've allowed us to exist in suffering that maybe some would turn to you. The greater good wasn't to wipe us off the face of the earth, but the greater good was that you would suffer long so that we would experience this suffering of this time as your mercy and that we would appreciate it and be grateful to the king who desired for us to turn toward him. Times are funny for us sometimes and we don't know what the future holds. And uh, aside from the obvious matters that we all uh, are, all of our uh, you know, concerns that we carry that are uh, known to each other and, and communally, we, we each have our own personal burdens, Lord, and, and we turn those over to you because the work to which you call us is so important. We need you in our lives every day so that your mission can move forward. We're not giving up, Lord. We're here and we're asking you to give us a little more time to grow your family so the celebration will be that much greater. I thank you, Lord God, for the hearts of those on this call and those that are in the background who have made this moment possible not when they called me about it a couple of weeks ago, but when they called me about it in Chaplain Cola's office to start this journey. I thank you, Lord God, that they dared to trust you to do this crazy thing. And we're praying, Lord, that it's producing the fruit 
for what you intended. We know there is so much more that we want to do, and we're just going to have to trust you in the matter. We believe this is your thing. We believe you started something, and you're not going to uh, quit on us until you see it through. And we're just going to have faith, Father God, that, that your provision is there. Give us the discernment. Give us the, the vision to step according to your will. I pray, Lord, that all the things in the background and in our periphery that want to draw our attention from the focus that we should have on your mission, that you're going to handle those things so that we can be more efficient toward advancing your mission in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for Weinbrenner. We trust that you're going to bless them as they equip your people for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Juan, for being here with us tonight. And thank you for everybody who has joined us here. Thank you all for coming. And uh, again, we'll leave the meeting open for a bit if you want to stay and visit. <laughs>